Hello everyone, and welcome back to Season 2 of Tech Expresso, where we serve quick, insightful, and engaging tech discussions. I'm your host, Veer Verma, and to kick off the new season, I'm thrilled to be speaking with Rajeshwaran Murthy, the Managing Director and Chair of the Space Economy at the Chart Think Tank. He's also a two-time TEDx speaker and a global keynote presenter, bringing valuable insights into the intersection of space, innovation, and sustainability. Rod is a strategy and technology leader who specializes in space economy commercialization, future foresight, and digital transformation. His work focuses on bridging investment policy and technology to help organizations navigate complex challenges and capitalize on emerging opportunities. He advises government startups and major organizations on building strategic roadmaps that are not just future-ready, but future-shaping. With expertise across several different industries, Rod plays a key role in helping both the public and private sector leaders understand how space-based technologies are becoming essential to a global economic development. His ability to connect deep tech with big picture strategy has made him a thought leader in a field that's rapidly moving from science fiction to boardroom reality. This episode is packed with forward-looking ideas on where the space industry is headed and what it means for our world. Let's dive right in. Hello everyone and welcome back to Tech Espresso. I'm super excited to be here today with Raj, someone who's deeply involved in thinking about the future, especially when it comes to space. In this episode, we're going to be talking about three big topics. What the space economy actually is, how strategic foresight helps us plan for the future of space, and what breakthroughs we might see in the next five to 10 years that could change everything. So Raj, thank you so much for joining me, with me today, and let's get right to it. Hey, thank you, Vera. It was so nice to see everyone. It's a pleasure being here. I appreciate the invite. Yeah, absolutely. So, so for the first question, it's kind of crazy how much space is becoming part of everyday conversations. For most people, when we hear space, we think about astronauts floating in zero gravity or rockets launching into the orbit. But behind all of that, there's this entire concept called the space economy. And and it seems like it's way more than just science or exploration. It's becoming something that can actually impact jobs, technology, and even our daily lives. So to start off, what exactly is the space economy and what kind of industries or activities are included? And why is it becoming such a big focus right now? No, I think that's a good um, good place to start with because there's a bit of history attached to it. Because suddenly you're hearing the space economy word throwing left and right. And historically, you don't have the word economy. You always talk about space sector, but it became an economy, right? So just to give you context, as you said, right, originally space is seen as a very much um, public-driven sector. What I mean by public-driven sector is um, the launch of sending astronaut for science research, for communication purposes, satellite. It was heavily dominated by public sector. The only extension of that for private sector was telecommunication because of satellites. So that's the furthest end you can stretch back in the day or a couple of, I would say even a decade ago where space is only involved exclusively with the public sector uh, for humanity research, science research and those kind of stuff. And then you have a bit of 10 to 5% where private sector coming in primarily because of telecommunication because you need satellites to operate telecoms, as simple as that. But very recently, that concept has changed. And that has to do with the fact uh, we when, uh, I think a decade ago, one of the major, um, I think I would say, um, paramount invention or paramount change in the sector was the capability of doing relaunch. So just in a nutshell, relaunch basically means that when we were sending anything to space, we were sending it as a one-way street. So the cost of OPEX was very high because whatever payload you want to send, let it be a satellite, let it be a probe, let it be um, even a, what do you call that, uh, any form of NTNs, it would just eat up the entire cost of the launch because you cannot recover your launch or launcher. But with the new capabilities such as relaunch capability, of course, a lot has to do with SpaceX ingenuity, but other companies are starting to follow. The cost of launch have fallen dramatically. And if you ask me how much is fallen, there's no right way to figure it out. But approximately in 1980s or somewhere before the relaunch capability, um, we're looking at about $80,000 for one kilogram average. And right now it's less than $1,000. And you can attach other things. So if you can imagine, right, how the domino effect took in play, the domino effect took in play because now I'm able to send a lot of things in a smaller scale to test, to prove, to, to validate, to hypothesize. You can do more with space than before. That was the initial, I would say, bubble. And then what happened was we found out that um, Earth itself, right, we have different levels of orbit. It's not new, but it's already existed for a long time ago. We have geo-orbit, which is basically anytime you and I talk about satellite, we are talking about geo-satellite. 
The geo satellite is the one that is huge, massive ones that is locked towards Earth, which means if Earth rotates uh, or exits uh, orbits about 24 hours, this also orbits the same way how Earth is rotating. So it's locked to Earth's orbit. Then you have something called MEO, which is Middle Earth Orbit, right between Earth and this geo. And then you have something called LEO, which is Low Earth Orbit. Now, the low Earth orbit is very interesting here because it's the closest one to Earth. It can orbit, if I'm not wrong, 25 times per day because it's faster, because it's nearer. And because it's closer by physics, it has very low latency. Yeah. So if you look at in terms of data ping, if you send one data ping to Geo, by the time that data ping comes back, Leo would have done 70, 214 times of the same data ping. So that is where the new space economy came in because now we can use LEO-based orbit to send satellite probe kind of way, anything you want to do with it, um, to be able to advance research. And that gave birth to this private sector coming in. And in a nutshell, I know we have more conversation on that. The space economy, if you ask me in my humble word, it's heavily denominated by private sector playing a very huge role compared to public sector. So that's where the new space economy coming heavily fueled by the fact that you have the Leo space sector economy uh, concept moving. Yeah, that really put things into perspective. I think what stood out to me is how the space economy isn't just about what happens in space, but how it connects back to Earth, like communication, network, communication networks, GPS, weather tracking, and even, even the potential for things like um, space mining or solar energy collection. And um, what's even more surprising is like how it's a lot more integrated into our lives than people ever realized or like I ever realized. And as a student, when you when you when you hear the word space, like the first thought that comes to your mind is a NASA scientist. But hearing this, it sounds like there's so many more different in, um, industries, such as engineering, data, business and even law that uh, could play a role. And it made me realize that space isn't something like that's far off in the future, but it's something that's already here and it's growing pretty fast, actually. And if the economy around space uh, keep spending, people my age might actually end up working in careers that didn't even exist a few years ago. And that's kind of mind blowing to me to think about it. N the next question is about strategic foresight. A lot of people think about how the space industry is moving fast, but I feel like it's just not about keeping up. It's about planning smart. And when I started um, learning about the stuff, reading about the stuff, I came around this term called strategic foresight. It sounds really important, but also kind of complex. So I'm wondering what it actually means in practice. So what is strategic foresight and how does it apply to the space economy? And how can it help us make better long-term decisions around things like investment, innovation, or policy? Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think you're touching two elements there. One is you're looking at a, a prediction tool, which is strategic foresight, and then you're also looking at space itself, right? So I'll just try to tackle this separately and I'll combine. Strategic foresight in a nutshell, where it's a one of, um, a better way for us to predict the future for the, for the layman too. You have many different tools, but no matter what tool you choose, the tool will always involve two things, the complexity and then the timeline. So when you deal with high complexity, high timeline, you use a tool that is far more advanced, but when you deal with low complexity, low timeline that you want to predict next month, next, next year for a specific sector, for a specific, you use a very simple tool. Some of the tools that I'm going to run through is like SWOT analysis, um, decision tree, and war gaming, and then the list goes on scenario planning. And I think as, as it evolves, right, it gets very high complex about the uncertainty of the future and the highest timeline. Strategic foresight sits in that realm where you wanna have an understanding what is the future is going to look like in regards to your current position so that you're able to mitigate some competitive edge, some strategic level. Think of it like if I were to tell you that the world is starting to become more into hybrid mode. Is no longer the concept of people have to be in the office or people have to be at working from home. So the hybrid concept two years ago, when we predicted as a strategic foresight, that's the world we envision happening. How would you able to tackle that world? So that is the, the very basic understanding of what strategic foresight means is able to have this future lens to see how things will unravel overall. It also includes a lot of other tools as well, not just a standalone. Strategic foresight is, a, is an extension of a few things. One of them is also mega trends, trends that is collectively shaping um, the world as we see fit. Now, why strategic foresight is important for space is because every time we talk about the current space economy or the new space economy, 
that which is a new term coming up, people are seeing this as a two different uh, pieces, which is very uh, not the best way to see in my in my regard, because it's not to say the world become heavily on space. What we're trying to say is that there's one component between space. There's many components affecting. I, I, we can go on and on from medicine to biotech to pharma to collective understanding of our science to lunar, the Mars colonization. There's a lot of other factors, but there's one common denominator easily connecting our world and the upcoming new space, and that is the data world. So when you look at data perspective, you can't run away. Everyone here is part of data world, one way or another. And I think that also why when you mention about some of the way uh, the job sector, one of the things I used to tell, I know I'm digressing, but I'll make a quick note here, is every single job we're doing right now will be part of space one way or another. You don't have to change your role. It just space will become an extension of what you're already doing. Now, a very simple example is the current boom of AI is putting a lot of pressure on data pipeline, the global data pipeline, because now we are, we are so accustomed with trying to use our time where AI can't help. So AI can take all the mundane stuff. And an extension of that is also weird. I don't know if you know this concept, it's called digital twin, where we try to build a digital replication model of a virtual world, of a real world. Now we are trying to put AI on top of it. All that to say, right, there's a lot of need to have credible, low latency, high computing processing data that needs to be fed in. Right now, we are processing data internally within um, Earth to fiber cables and all the undersea cables and processing servers and all. Now, we are trying to see a world where LEO satellite or LEO orbital data center will take that load and be able to process it at a fraction of the same second and will downlink back to you. When you do that, the opportunity just scales up. It becomes something... Now, the bottleneck is not data pipeline. The bottleneck is us. You have this strong level of data coming in in any capacity. Now, therefore, you need to increase your analytic capability. You need to increase the type of output. You need to increase the type of hardware, the solutions you're going to provide. So the use case just trickles down, right? I think, and that's where strategic foresight really plays a role because right now we're seeing a world where that on the data side, this is one. Then the second one, I also want to give context to you. In LEO, low Earth orbit, we call this area microgravity. Well, we don't call anything zero gravity because zero gravity doesn't really exist. In it, it, There's always some element of gravity being pulled in LEO. So we call the microgravity zone. What is microgravity zone basically means no G. So there's no up, there's no down, there's no left and right. It just, con I think, constant state of emotion where it's just standard floating, right? And what we're doing in that, we're doing research for manufacturing. Imagine if we can build silicon wafers without any interruption from any dust at a fraction of the cost. Imagine if we can do scientific uh, analysis on genome, seeds, uh, gene studies, without, in, without getting interference from different parts of, um, I would call it foreign, environment, foreign variables. So that is also happening on the science side, data side, and, and the list keeps going on and on. So just to wrap it right, the strategic foresight I'm, here I'm saying is there's a lot whatever happens in the Leo sector directly and indirectly affecting our current world. And if you want to get an edge to it, you need to be aware of what is happening, what we're trying to build, what startups are trying to look at, what governments are funding, what the universe, uh, sorry, the world is trying to prepare in this part of the world, because that has a very close relationship to everything you're doing, rather than seeing it as an isolated way. Um, in summary, when we used to think a while back, AI is not going to impact us, right? And it did. Think of the same as space, but a few million times more. It will directly be part of your ecosystem. I think that's where the strategic foresight helps. Yeah, that's a power, powerful way of thinking of it. Um, the way I like to think about it is it's just not predicting one's future, but preparing for multiple possibilities, like you said, like the example of AI. But in schools especially, we usually focus at the present. What's due tomorrow? What exams are going to come up in the week? But the idea of zooming out and thinking in decades instead of just days is something that I think we should all need, that's something that we all need to learn. And this, this relates to the space economy because that long-term thinking is, seems even more crucial. And the investments that people make now, whether it's in satellite infrastructure, um, space tourism, or even international regulations are going to shape what space looks like, not just next year or like in five years, but maybe 30 or 50 years from now. And um, that means the choices we make even today
even as students or early careers professionals, can help us define whether space becomes more accessible, more equitable, or even more sustainable. So strategic foresight seems like a really important mindset, not just for governments and CEOs, but for anyone who wants to play a role in the future of space. So um, this leads to my next question, which is the future. Right now, it feels like space is at a turning point. We've seen massive pro progress already, like reusable rockets, satellite constellations, and private space companies stepping to leadership roles. But it feels like this is still the early stage of something even bigger to happen. So what major changes or breakthroughs do you think could happen in the next five to 10 years that might change the way we think about the space economy today, both in space and here on Earth? I think that's, um, that's a very, I think that's a million dollar question that we keep going on and on. While there's a lot of effort being done, there's still not being done enough. And I think I'll start with the very fact that there's, a, there's a, always this big knowledge gap between the current market and the space sector. And I think we need to bridge that gap and a lot of effort being put onto that. What, what is all that to say is the future of space sector is, of course, there's few streams. There's upstream where you're talking about the space launch, the satellite, the astronaut, and then landing, cislunar, deep space, and all the very, very, very uh, complex stuff. And then you also have the downstream. So in my view, I feel the upcoming um, future is going to be heavily concentrating on the downstream of the space market. Downstream of the space market basically means where any kind of solution data we're extracting from space sector, that's what falls under downstream. To, cap to conceptualize it a bit more, we have three kind of domains right now. We have Earth observation, we have SETCOM, which is satellite communication, and then we have PNT. Now, PNT basically GPS, which is everyone accustomed to. Um, SETCOM is basically an example of Starlink. And then Earth observation is nothing more than the ability for us to capture Earth's surface much more faster, accurate, and reliable. There's a lot of effort being done on all of this potential, all of this stream under downstream sector. And I think a lot of the next uh, next frontier will be revolving around downstream, which means the ability for us to really democratize access to Earth observation data where everyone has their own GPT model of Earth in different sector. A very simple example, right? Insurance sector are using Earth observation data to automate claims. You can use Earth observation data to predict a disaster before it even happens. That's only for emergency purposes. But if I were to flip it back, you can use Earth observation data to do urban traffic management to see how things are planning with AI support included. So I see a lot of massive opportunity being discovered, explored, and tested uh, within the Earth observation, SATCOM, which is already coming up, and PNT side of it. Uh, I think that will be the first part of the next frontier within this realm, downstream sector. Then equally, I think what will happen is the upstream sector will also come into play uh, eventually because it takes more time for ROI. But first, will be downstream sector impact, then we'll move on to upstream. Yeah, um, I feel like that opens up many new possibilities in space economy. And sometimes we like underestimate how quickly things can change what, like, in many different sectors. But like, I mean, in just the past few years, we've gone from space being mostly um, government-led to becoming a whole new frontier for private companies, startups, and even international partnerships. And if something like an or orbit manufacturing or lunar infrastructure or even space-based solar power becomes real in the next decade, that could completely reshape how we live and work on Earth. And um, especially from my perspective as a student, it's kind of, it's really, it's really inspiring. We've always been told to think about the future of work or what careers are going to be in demand. But it feels like space is one of those rare areas where we can actually help define the future right now. And whether it's, whether it's to science, design, policy, or even storytelling, there's room for all kinds of skills in the next wave of innovation. And the idea that we could all, that we could be a part of building that, that's kind of something students should get excited about. So thank you very much, Raj, for this conversation. This will bring, this will bring the end of our conversation. Thank you so much for joining me today on Tech Expresso. I really appreciate you taking the time to break down these big ideas and help us see how the future of space is becoming something we could all be a part of. So thank you. No, no worries. Space is always growing. Um, it needs more access. I think it's going to be defined by not by us, by the upcoming generation, especially the students. So there's a lot of opportunity and it doesn't always have to be from the science part. It has to do with everything, as you said in the beginning, right? Business, law, you name it. Every part of the sector you're building can help in space in one way or another. And I think it's all about how we try to position yourself. But I um, hope this short conversation was helpful and inspires um, someone out there to think about space a bit more differently. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you.